Welcome to the fifth annual 1455 Story Fest. My name is Kim Roberts, and this is the DC Pride Poetry Reading. Uh, we are featuring eight terrific poets, all of whom uh, participated in the 2023 DC Pride Poem A Day project. This is a project that I co-curate with John Gann. And uh, in this project, we release one short video every day in the month of June, uh, featuring a different LGBTQ plus poet from the greater Washington DC region. So you will get a sense of the whole by hearing these eight uh, poets reading in this session. Um, the DC Pride Poem A Day project can be found online at pridepoems.com. Our first reader is Kathy Wolf. Kathy has published work in Poetry, The New York Times, Beltway Poetry Quarterly, QDA, A Queer Disability Anthology, and other publications. She was a 2008 Lambda Literary Emerging Writer Fellow. Her most recent poetry collection is Love and Kumquats. Wolf is a contributor with the Washington Blade. Kathy Wolf. Thank, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be a part of this uh, reading for the festival, and I'm thrilled to be a part of the DC Pride Poem A Day project. I, I grew up in a small town in Southern New Jersey, and I had this wonderful aunt who would come and bring us cupcakes and tell us wonderful stories about her life in what I thought was this magical world of Washington, DC, especially about her time during World War II. So this first poem is called Blossoms. Blossoms for my aunt. When I was seven, I didn't want to grow up to be an old maid like you. I knew only a hubby, two children, a girl wearing red Mary Janes, a boy with blue suspenders, and a dog like Lassie would do for me. But I loved to lick the icing of the pretty pink cupcakes he brought to our house, to bark like a seal, as you taught me to do. It was swell during the war, you said, when I was 15. I left the Pine Barrens for Washington, D.C. I met Eleanor R. at a hot shop. I was so excited, my hands shook when she lit my cigarette. I fell in love with Rose by the cherry blossoms. I don't know how things with you and Rose ended up. You never mentioned her to me again. Now in DC alone, no kids or dog, years after my lover's death, I take a breath and carry on your life. Like so many queer people I know, I love Judy Garland. I love to hear her, especially her concert at Carnegie Hall. I love to hear her look at, go on YouTube and see clips of her talking on talk shows. So this next poem is called Trolley. Trolley for Judy Garland on the 50th anniversary of her death. I don't know how you always meet us in St. Louis, Hong Kong, in mid kiss, hearts wronged, morphing your monster mom, bad husbands, demon pills into spellbinding song, knowing what we know, good witches spells don't gel, trolleys veer off the tracks, strangers kiss and tell, Crowds get out of whack. Who would dare to board a trolley, befriend a tin man, or march in an Easter parade? Yet decades after you're gone, you make us see rainbows we don't see. Step on the trolley, slipping off its tracks. Fall in step with the most crowded parade in town. No matter what goes wrong, 
what stars are born or die, you still sing the trolley song. And this last poem is called, This is Not a Love Poem, and I Love to Read Her on Valentine's Day. This is not, this is not a love poem. There were no lover serenades, candlelit dinners, bridal trains, towering cakes, solemn vows. One night we dressed in torn shorts, ripped tops, flip flops. We'd forgotten to clean the cat's litter box. The light bulb above our head went out. Next door, the neighbor's six year old played chopsticks on the piano. Sure, let's get hitched. We let sure let's get hitched. We agreed, digging into the mac and cheese. We exchanged ring dings. Our tongues will never forget the taste. Thank you so much. I'm so thrilled and honored to have been a part of this. Oh, great reading. Thank you so much. That was Kathy Wolf. Our next reader is Robert L. Guyron. Robert is the author of five collections of poetry and editor of four anthologies. His poetry and fiction have appeared in national and international anthologies. He, he was born in Nebraska, but he describes himself as a transplanted Texan with family roots that go back over four centuries. But he currently lives in Arlington, Virginia with his husband. Uh, he discovered recently that his ancestry covers most of Europe and the greater Mediterranean area, including indigenous roots from Mexico and Texas. So he is truly a man of the world. Uh, he is associate editor for the Potomac Review, editor in chief of Arley Joe, and is the founder and publisher of Jival Press, Robert L. Guyron. You need to unmute, Robert. Okay, sorry, <laughs> sorry. No, uh, thank you. Right. Is it okay now? Yeah, thank you, Kim, for inviting me to read today. Um, I'm going to read the first poem that was published in the, um, the DC Pride Poems. It's titled, um, The Vista from the Mediterranean Sea. Picture a tree, one with deep roots, going deep into the ground, spreading out amongst the land, with branches twisting like the sinew of flesh, not unlike the olive tree, bark rich in hue and texture, bearing fruit as then, now, and into the future. There amongst the rock, cacti, Wildflowers cover the terrain, lush with life, out towards the sea. As bees swarm about, drawing in nectar from blossom to blossom, then the rich lather of honey bathes the hive, and we, the bearers of knowledge, gather treasures to last a lifetime. The next poem is titled uh, The Pilgrimage. I was just recently in Spain, and um, so Spain is on my mind, but this is actually about uh, Walt Whitman, and it was published in Beltway Quarterly. So thanks again, Kim. Uh, the Pilgrimage. On a pilgrimage likened to those who need to Santiago de Compostela, those who rock before the Wailing Wall, or those in a dervish days circling Mecca, I stand before your bed, and touch the wooden railing. Smooth as porcelain, by countless rubbings by manly hands, as if wanting to commune with you, I wait patiently for some sign to revive the first time I read Leaves of Grass and felt my spirit leap, sensing the brotherhood in your words, knowing that we had a commonality crossing decades. I look around and vaguely feel the calling of America, the brotherhood of muscle, valor, and independence, the need to be free in oneself among the masses, the celebration of the body electric, the common man, the mechanic, the captain of my life, rooted to the earth, 
a silver oak of determination, but a fateful willow of pliability. I sing to myself the calling of joy you felt among the men. You are with me and I am refreshed, flowing with the river ebbed by the sting of life. I quiver, undulating, until I grasp the gossiper thread of my soul. Now I'm gonna to switch to El Paso. Kim mentioned that I was born in Nebraska, of all places, that's where Gyron comes from. Because um, if I'm speaking Spanish, it's Giron, and if I'm speaking French, it's Giron. I know, it's a trilingual thing. Anyway, uh, El Paso. Uh, Cosmos and the El Paso Desert. One comes from the same source, like the leaves on the tree, we are different. And upon the earth, we search for our land. Life is like the dew that falls on a crisp day. Yet while in the desert, only the silk of the cobwebs can lead us back to the labyrinth of our stay. Uh, this next poem uh, is about an incident that took place in El Paso, December 20, uh, 2009. Uh, 2009, um, about men kissing, of all things. Anyway, Enigma in El Paso. Why can an act in a taco bar make the papers and cause men to be evicted? When a man kisses another on the lips, all hell breaks loose. How is it that a mere public display of affection can stop the world? I think it's rather comical that it actually they got evicted and it made the newspapers in El Paso. Anyway, um, this next poem is, I didn't realize it, but the title of it, which actually comes from my, my poetry collection, Metamorphosis of the Serpent God, which I wrote in the, um, started in the 70s. Uh, it's titled Guardians of Wake. And it, in light of what's happening in this country, I thought it was still appropriate and I didn't realize the title would have another nuance to it, but it does. Here we go. Guardians of Wake. We are on the edge and inhale the vileness of the state. And though we dress the living and color with our visions, we are placed as midwives at the gate to care for the broken, filed like sod blocks to reconstruct Solomon's temple. Yet quartering and burning us at the stake cannot contain the cataclysmic energy that pulls us together like a tribe searching for its soul. Thank you, Kim. Uh, thank you so much, Robert L. Guyron, or Heron. <laughs> Where is she going? <laughs> Uh, our next reader is, oh, uh, now, Jessica, you told me how to pronounce it. Uh, Jessica Genya. 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 Genya, thank you. Jessica Genya Simon. Uh, and Jessica is the author of a newly released book of poems, Built of All I Shape and Name. It came out just earlier this year. Uh, she began writing poetry at age seven and as a teenager attended the University of Virginia's Young Writers Workshop and competed and won a spot on the Brave New Voices 2001 DC National Youth Poetry Slam team. Uh, she then earned a BA in English and Textual Studies and Policy Studies at Syracuse University and her MS in Education from the University of Pennsylvania. She spent a year in Jerusalem studying at Pardes Institute for Jewish Studies and volunteering with, an LG, uh, with LGBTQ plus and Middle East peace organizations. She works today at a gun violence prevention nonprofit in Washington, DC, and she lives with her wife and daughter in Silver Spring, Maryland. Jessica Genya Simon. Thank you so much, Kim. And thank you to the organizers of the 1455 Festival. Uh, story festival. Um, I'm going to read a few poems from the book, which is here, built of all I shape and name, including the, the one that uh, Kim featured in DC Pride poems a day. Um, the first one is called Fear of Burning. She walked home in a slumber, pulled off her boots, shook snow from the cuffs, 
slept one last time as a woman with desires she could deny. She awoke next to a large window, saw snowflakes falling, dancing, delicate, floating pieces of sky. She turned last night's snow into heat, allowed her hand to run from hip to waist to brush the curve of a breast. She touched lips, kissed a neck, cradled and traced hips, all the while shedding 19 years of learning not to kiss them for fear of burning. Thanks. The next one is called Jewish Tourist in Toledo, Spain. So speaking a little bit with Robert's poems. Stones are more reliable than men. On the walls of this Catholic church, once a synagogue, then a mosque, a cross adorns the throne, but a star of David hides in a ceiling tile, a converso. Arabic appears through whitewash, a morisco. In a souvenir shop, a man shows me a statue of the Virgin Mary that used to hide a mezuzah on a door jamb, points to his forearm, Jewish blood. He tells me his grandfather kept the key to the Toledo home abandoned after the Inquisition. A Palestinian man holds onto a key to his grandfather's house in Jerusalem, a house that may or may not still stand. There exists a certain amnesia in countries and pious men. One God paints over another, switches the symbol above the door. Men chisel granite, build cities atop cities, say there is nothing beneath, but stone remains. No matter how deep truth is buried, time turns rock to fossilized braille. Men hold onto keys and history flows down tributaries of memory to etched stones. I turn to leave Toledo, cross back over the bridge as the city ebbs away through the window of the train. And the last, thank you. And the last piece I'll do is called Apology for the I'm Sorry's. I apologize for the I'm sorry's that escape my mouth in advance of saying almost anything. The apology I give because I am the wrong of woman, wrong size, wrong sex, wrong sexuality. I mean, I am short, squat, my belly protrudes over top my jeans. I apologize for a clitoris that feels pleasure when plucked. I apologize for my speech. I'm sorry for my aggressive, tone, meaning louder than you, or meaning too confident, or that I believe in what I am saying. I apologize for my opinions, that I have them in the first place, about most things, that I dare to say them or argue my rightness and your wrongness, or speak at all in a room full of talking men, or a room full of quiet women. I apologize for my volume, being too brash for my cackle laugh for how I am dressed in a slogan t-shirt and too short mom jeans or too tight jeans, for my butt not being tight or high enough, for my breasts being different sizes, for the blood falling out of my vagina, for not being dressed up enough, for my hair being too kinky or too curly or straightened or not, for my makeup being applied incorrectly, too little eyeliner, too much foundation, not blended in, not enough rouge or not applied at all. For the hairs on my upper lip, which are not blonde. For the stain of chocolate ice cream on my pants. For the chip with salsa I just dropped onto the carpet. For the insult that flew too quickly out of my mouth. I apologize in advance before I say what I think. I apologize in case I say what makes you or the room uncomfortable. I apologize for the truth I feel compelled to speak. I apologize to myself for over apologizing. My God, I am so sorry all of the damn time for what I feel, for what I do not feel. How the hell did I learn to give a fuck so often? 
I am so good at feeling so bad. Learned so young to be a good girl, to feel sorry for being bad. Being bad is one who does not follow rules. I follow them. What in a day full of apologies can an apology even mean? Thank you. Whoa. <laughs> Jessica Genya Simon, thank you so much. Uh, next up is Kay Tyler Christensen. Uh, Tyler holds a PhD in American literature and culture from the George Washington University, and he uh, lectures in literature and critical race, gender, and culture studies at American University. Tyler is the author of the chapbook, That Boy from Idaho, which was chosen for publication as part of Ghost City Press's summer series in 2020. Hey, Tyler Christensen. Hi, thank you so much for having me, Kim. And thanks to um, the, uh, the folks at, um, uh, what is it called? <laughs> 1440, 1455, 1455, I almost said 1444, story 1455 Storyfest. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it very much. Um, this is exciting to read with all of you folks, many of you who I've long admired. So um, it's fun to get to know your folks too. I'm going to start with the title poem from my um, uh, mini chapbook here called That Boy from Idaho. That boy from Idaho bears the ceiling at his neck, sits in a crawl space of his emotions, strains to see anything else but a shoebox full of cassette tapes that conjure up a fire island dream. That boy from Idaho can dream. Straps a Walkman to his Wranglers every morning, rests cold as hell sprinkler pipe to his chest and treks through mud and alfalfa, dodges field mice and self-deprecation, sings at the top of his lungs about a world that boy from Idaho has only ever dreamt about. That boy from Idaho is not bound by time, returns to the crawl space of his emotions, pulls the door shut behind him, repeats push-ups, witnesses a bicep for no one. That boy from Idaho flexes in a long mirror for no one, collapses onto the dirt floor of the crawl space, stickies the pages of international mail for himself, Crotch watches and imagines all the possible places he could wear a mesh jockstrap. That boy from Idaho prays, gives thanks, tells God it's just love that he wants. The next one I'm going to read is called In Those Days. In those days, the basement floor held my tears before it held my head to sleep. In those days, I watched episodes of Queer as Folk and listened to R have sex with L in the bed above me as payment, as a thank you to L for a soft place to land before R and me found a place to call our own. And I didn't care in those days that it meant sharing a queen bed and couch surfing on nights when R was with T and I was with A. In those days, $5 at Wendy's was enough to feed two just out of the closet queers, a small fry, a Diet Coke, and a spicy chicken sandwich cut in half. In those days, I would call home from the parking lot of Elle's house and it would ring more than once before my mother would pick up, before I would have the chance to tell her about how I knew that Justin and Brian weren't going to end up together in the end. So the thumpa thumpa continues. No, in those days before I could say anything more than hello, my mother would pass the phone to my father, who would ask me how my car was running, if I found if I'd found a place to live yet, and if I was ready to come home. Home, a parking lot and a basement floor in Holiday, Utah, episodes of Queer as Folk and a table for two at a Wendy's off North Temple, that irrevocable condition. I'm gonna end with reading um, my Pride Home a Day called Dear David. It's for uh, David Vonarovich. Dear David, you died on my 11th birthday. While I blew out my candles, you drew your last breath, death by government neglect, artist, activist, writer, thinker, hustler. AIDS took you and your friends from the world of art and politics, and I am your inheritor, your queer progeny, a descendant spreading your words as if they are your ashes spread on the White House lawn. I spread your words to the bent ears of this generation of lovers, to anyone who wakes up in this killing machine called America and who knows what it is like to have a target at their back. 
to be marked as expendable um, uh, and to be subject to the eradicating impulses of the United States government who spread the lie of the one tribe nation and falsely promise freedom, then indict us for who we love, abandon us when we show up sick in the world they have created for a select few. I spread your words, not as if they are your ashes, but because they are your ashes, they are what is left of you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Kay Tyler Christensen. Uh, and up next is Natalie E. Illum. Natalie is a poet, disability activist, and singer living in Washington, DC. She is a four-time recipient of the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities Literary Fellowship and a multiple Pushcart Prize, Best of the Net, and Best New Poet nominee. She was a founding board member of the pioneering uh, LGBTQA open mic Mother Tongue that lasted for 15 years in DC. Uh, Natalie competed in the National Poetry Slam circuit and was the 2013 Beltway Grand Slam champion. She is an MFA from American University, Natalie E. Illum. Thank you so much, Kim. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you to the 1455 Story Festival. Um, I'm going to read three quick poems, um, all of which tie to my family. Um, however, the first one is uh, fiction, and I actually wrote it during the MFA. It's after Alice Siebold's um, The Lovely Bones. Um, and I was so struck by how much the character uh, wanted to stay with their family and um, protect their family, uh, which is not something that I do in my writing. <laughs> so uh, this is the poem that was featured in uh, the Pride Poem a Day. Uh, it's called Lucky or Lovely. It's after Alice Siebold. I wanted to tell you, Mama, it wasn't a sharp plunging into blackness. It wasn't a hard fall. Not like the time I broke my kneecap roller skating in the kitchen or the night I was kissed into oblivion. All I know is there were dark smudges treetops too far below that the buildings appeared like northern lights. I tried to remember the equation for speed to calculate my death like a ninth grade math problem, but there was only time to think of your devastation, your devotion, how I would move beyond your forever loss. I wanted to absolve the impact, whisper my small happinesses, but my memory wavered like this plane. I was combustible. I love you, mama, a bone shattering love. Please know I wasn't a broken bird. I was freed from the velocity of flying. I rose as my body collapsed. I soared above the wreckage. And um, this next poem, uh, my dear friend and cohort, cohort uh, Jonah Coulson is also here. Um, he is the poetry editor of Washington Writers Publishing House, uh, which accepted this poem last year or the year before, who could tell with the pandemic. Um, I'm working on a shark series that I never finish. Uh, it's called uh, My Fear of Sharks is Just a Metaphor, um, and this poem is called Bull Sharks of Long Island. It's a pantoum form poem. Bull Sharks of Long Island. My mother's green dress is a wound on our front lawn, an ineffective fertilizer. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. Bike Bite marks frame our windows. The neighbors never lose their teeth. No one leaves home unless the next zip code over is full of chemicals. Blood pools in the soil of their backyards. Cancer attacks even the most effective 
fertilizer. The rich don't know they're ingesting poison. My father's elixir is Budweiser and tequila. Addiction is the most effective fertilizer to drown a middle-class garden. My parents turned our house into a riptide. Her skirt is a pool of chum in the backyard to kill any lingering flowers. No one leaves home unless you find a lifeguard. This town circles around its neighbor. Our lawns bloom with fresh tumors. I hinge on the sharp jaw of our secrets. My home is the mouth of a shark. And um, thank you. Uh, this last poem is kind of a uh, companion to that poem. I wrote them uh, a couple of years apart, um, but it really is like the B side to the bull shark poem. So there are some repeating themes because my parents don't change. <laughs> so, uh, I love them. They're great. Great. So this is called My Fear of Water Came Later. My family doesn't like the desert air. We prefer low tide to high altitudes, coastal highways to mountains. We don't ski. We charter. We choose our bait with precision, precision, precision. We don't let the lines go slack. We hunt the Mako because we can. We don't relish a shoreline. We forget we live so close to what most people would pay dearly for. We aren't moved by the stunning sunsets. My father named his boat, Bite Me. That isn't a joke. We made fun of my mother when she said, I specifically told you not to do that. She wasn't born here, but she is a water sign. Said, if I'm drowning, I should. Try to play dead and hope the Coast Guard finds me in time and face up. We don't fear the riptide we live in. We just call our flying dishes fish. We imagine all our broken glass finds its way into the Atlantic for some sweet kids to discover. Our arguments finally smooth enough to call treasure. Look how pretty we are now. The light hits us just right. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. So is Natalie E. Ilham. Uh, our next reader is Tanya Poperny. Tanya is a writer, editor, translator, and community builder in Washington, DC. The child of Soviet Jewish refugees, her works deal with violence, trauma, and resilience. Her essays, poetry, and reporting have appeared in Pacific Standard, Beltway Poetry Quarterly, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, Washington City Paper, the Literary Review, and elsewhere. Tanya is the recipient of awards and fellowships from the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities, Biographers International Organization, Vermont Studio Center, and Art Oh My Writers. Her chapbook and other valuables won the 2019 Tusculum Review Poetry Chapbook Prize. Her poem, Prababuk, Prababushka, I hope I said that correctly, Prababushka, which is about her revolutionary great-grandmother, was selected as Split This Rock's Poem of the Week in 2018. Tanya Paperni. Thank you, Kim. Um, it's so nice to read with you all, and those of you who I know I certainly haven't seen in probably three or four years since before the pandemic, so um, it's really nice to be here. Um, I'm going to read four poems. Um, the, the theme that Kim and John suggested for this year's Pride Poem a Day was heritage. So they'll all relate to that theme. And uh, given that my heritage is Russian, Ukrainian, and Ashkenazi Jewish, uh, these are not uplifting poems. So <laughs> deal with it, as I like to say. Um, this is the one that appeared on the Pride Poem a Day 
um, project this year. It's called How I Became a Writer. Cut paper, hand-bound black cardboard, ruler, X-Acto knife, self-healing mat, stone soup, submission mandates, my first book, a facility with language, Santa Monica Public Library on 7th Street, bilingual family home, three siblings born in a country that no longer exists, handmade paper mache puppets who refuse to speak English, log of a 1994 Moscow trip, it was very, very dirty there. I saw the place where they cut off people's heads. Ann Carson's autobiography of Red, an attempt to circumvent silence, escape the family home. Looking out the window of a Greyhound bus, looking out the window of an Amtrak train, neglected industry along the Northeast Corridor, Master Margarita, Gore Atuma, Jalabnaya Kniga, third, third culture kid, but not quite. Longing, diaspora, fracturing, the seductive lure of trauma. This poem is called The Red Thread, and a version of it appeared in Beltway Poetry Quarterly a number of years back. Pulling out individual agents of hair, cutting hairs of complacent length, creating hangnails to root them out, the attainment of social perfection through small acts of self-sabotage, cuticles as foreign agents, imprecisions demanding to be purged. Stalin is a member of my family, has been for four generations. Party membership requiring constant vigilance, dots of blood along the cuticle's edge, the degenerate nature of ghosts. This one's called Self-Portrait as a Cuticle, and I wrote it um, during a workshop with um, a former DC area poet, Taylor Johnson, um, who showed us um, a book by Danica Kelly. Um, I think it's called Bestiary or Bestiary. Um, so this was inspired by that. Connector of spaces, liminality abridged, the zone where skin becomes platen or penetrable, zone of vulnerability to puncture, to pain, a useful arc to trace, but not to color. Man says, no one will ever love you if you don't have nice nails. And since the nail begins at the cuticle, start the process of elimination, of refinement. There, by the wayside, keep listlessly picking skin that's already half dead, a hood you're not supposed to look under. And this last poem is called January 17th, 1994, which was the date of the Northridge earthquake in Southern California. What's Los Angeles if not a wanderer's mirage? What's developmentally appropriate for an eight-year-old? Handwriting along the bottom of a Polaroid or the 10 freeway mangled and collapsed. Several thousand aftershocks, red tagged buildings, rent control and a recession, streets with simultaneous fires and floods, the shuttered video store on Wilshire Boulevard. If we'd had Twitter back then, oh man, the disaster porn rabbit hole we would have fallen into. Anna and I posing on tall canvas chairs, the final photo of us as best friends and neighbors. But my subsequent private tragedies never broadcast. What's adolescence, if not all that remains after the break? What's a home after a deluge? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tanya Paperni. Uh, our next reader is Jonah Colson. Jonah is the author of the poetry collection Said Through Glass, which won the 2018 Jean Feldman Poetry Prize from Washington Writers Publishing House. He's also the co-editor of a terrific anthology, This Is What America Looks Like, Poetry and Fiction from DC, Maryland, and Virginia, which came out in 2021. Uh, Jonah's poems have appeared in Plowshares, The Southern Review, The Massachusetts Review, and elsewhere. His translations and interviews can be found in Prairie Schooner, Tupelo Quarterly, and The Writer's Chronicle. He's received fellowships from the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts and the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities. Jonah is a professor of ESL at Montgomery College in Maryland. He lives in Washington, DC. 
And in 2022, he became co-president with Caroline Bach of the Washington Writers Publishing House and edits the bi-weekly journal WWPH Writes. Jonah Colson. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kim, for this opportunity and for including me again, this wonderful project, Pride Poems a Day. It's so wonderful. And thank you to 1455 Story Fest and spearheaded by Sean Murphy. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you. And all these wonderful poets this evening. Just glorious. Thank you. So I'm going to read two poems this evening. The first poem is a poem that was included in the Pride Project. And it's only the second time I've ever read this poem actually aloud because, um, yeah, I just haven't read it a lot. But it kind of includes, you know, I was, I'm a January baby. So when you're, you know, if you ever go onto Google or put in a website of when you were born, you get an idea of when you were conceived. And uh, which is a little, uh, you know, a little strange, but um, that's in this poem. My favorite breakfast is in this poem. And also, you know, um, as Tanya said, the idea of heritage and, and the prompt uh, for this year, you know, thinking about your childhood it can be very often surreal and your memories are, I think, for me at least, a little bit warped. Um, but I grew up in central Maryland. I'm a Maryland boy. I live in DC now, but you know, Maryland was sort of, you know, where I lived was a sort of uh, pastoral fantasy, but it's very different now. The poem is called Self. What am I made of? Eggs over easy and white toast. A mid-April notion of love under spring's harsh blossom. Or a basket of red coxcombs and daisies beside my father's casket. It's hard to think beyond the house on the hill, the garden filled with corn and radishes. When I was five, I slept by a watermelon in the full moon and woke up to walk in the grass plants that are now covered in new homes and fences. Perhaps I am really anxious puffs of breath at 3 a.m. Since my mother said I am cursed and belong elsewhere, only to be missed someday. And I'm gonna read one more poem. This is a little bit longer, longer for me. I don't write very long poems. Um, my full name is Jonathan, but I go by Jonah. And if you're ever on a boat and your name is Jonah, you run into some trouble because uh, people automatically think that you're bad luck, um, which maybe I am sometimes on a boat. I'm not too great, great with boats, but it came out of this. And um, my partner of many, many years has a boat in the Chesapeake and we go out from Annapolis. Um, but it kind of deals with that. And also just ideas of, of you know, heritage again, who I am and, and at this moment, what I was experiencing. And I'm happy to bring Spain back into the mix here. There's a, uh, a little moment of Spain. It's one of my, you know, I'm Spanish in spirit. This poem is called Jonah's Whale. We sail out on the first weekend of the season into a north northwest wind over a springing bay of fish and crab. I rest on the stern, burning my mouth at a wind hot ash and watch the lighthouse pass by as easily as hands navigate a new body. I think my mother will soon die. What a strange thought to have sailing toward the bridge under a hot sun. Only two hours out and already there is death. I think there is something beneath us, perhaps a whale, only it is not. We are in the bay, not the ocean where I can go days and weeks and never reach land. I decide I am on the whale, its belly full of me, full of Jonah in the cockpit, two berths, two heads and gown. Being inside, I know this is how one starts a planet. It keeps digging to forget light and diesel fuel. Inside this whale, I have been five Spanish boys languishing on the beaches of Barcelona. I have been a queen sailing to a conquered empire. Oh, Chesapeake, I have grown up near your body all my life and stopped on your shores that smell like innards of fish and birds. 
You are a king my mother has never met, but only reads in the pages of my voyage. She knows how I am tossed about in the cabin and eat salt like caviar. The boat keeps going as though nothing else were happening, as if she were not dying. Each hour ripping through the bay, slicing down the innards, the belly, the rib cage, ripping through knot by nautical knot in bloodstreams and decay. My whale is fast and knows the way. Thank you. Thank you, Jonah Colson. Uh, our final reader is Tanya Olson. Tanya lives in Silver Spring, Maryland, and is a senior lecturer in English at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Her first book, Boyishly, was published by Yes, Yes Books in 2013 and received a 2014 American Book Award. Her second book, Stay, was released by Yes, Yes Books in 2019. She has received the Discovery Boston Review Prize. She was named a 2011 Lambda Fellow, Fellow by the Lambda Liber Literary Foundation. Her poem, 54 Prints, was chosen for inclusion in Best American Poems in 2015. And in 2023, she was one of five inaugural LBG, LGBTQ Poets in Residence at the Arts Club of Washington. Tanya Olson. Thank you, Kim. Um, and I want to thank the DC Pride uh, Poem a Day uh, folks for having me and uh, 1455 Story Fest for um, having this panel of the uh, Poem a Day uh, people. Uh, I'm going to read two poems tonight, um, and they are both uh, from a forthcoming book, uh, which uh, will be coming out with uh, Yes, Yes Books, hopefully in August 2024. And the book is called Last Butch Island. The first poem I'm gonna read is called, And They Look. And they look alike too, like my mother and I look alike. Every time we see Junior on Hee Haw, she notes he could be family. Big moon face, crinkle eye smile. Family is like a string to my mother. Every member a knot, connected but apart. In heaven, she says, you will recognize every knot on our string and they will already know you. One day, my mother declares she wants to be the woman who sings backup and plays tambourine for Culture Club. We have just gotten MTV and we still watch it like it's a show. Turn it on at the top of the hour and sit there for 30 minutes as the videos click by. Helen Terry, I discovered decades later when we have the internet and can wonder about a fact and then find it. My mother long dead never searched the internet. My mother never sent an email. Helen Terry, though, is still alive. Helen Terry is the big voice in all the great culture club songs. Karma Chameleon, I'll tumble for you. I know you miss me blind. Hers is the voice that echoes whatever boy George sings first. I'm a man, a man without conviction. Hers is the voice that holds up his. Progress is seldom a true story. Step up, slide back. But my friend Clark always likes to point out, you and I could spend whole lunch times discuss discussing whether boy George might possibly be gay. We share pronouns at the start of every meeting now, but honestly, I do not want to tell you my pronouns. Served in line, brothered by security, hey guide at the store. These moments of slippage are pure butch triumph. Between the guests, the confusion, the correction, I know I have been seen. I know how to watch MTV now, know how to look up facts, have yet to spend meaningful time with my mother since she died. Spotted her in the highest row of a stadium once. She stood when I stood, sat when I sat. When they called my name, she pounded her hands together like she was playing a tambourine. She shows up in my dreams, but we speak of nothing real. I know not of an afterlife or if we are gifted a chance to live again. In this, as in so many things, I am a man, a man who does not know. 
don't come home. Don't come home a drinking, Miss Loretta sang with lovin' on your mind. Loretta wrote that song after she and Patsy Cline became friends. Patsy taught Loretta how to move, what to say, what to wear on stage. Taught her that the song, not family, not love, could structure her life. Told her she was the one with the talent in that marriage, and it was time to quit taking guff off a of do. No artist is an artist unless she pleases first herself. No woman knows how to woman until she is taught. The friendship between Patsy and Loretta is at the core of Coal Miner's Daughter, the rare movie made about a woman singer. It is the only movie I stop to watch when I find it on TV, a movie that teaches how to be the artist you are meant to be when nobody else says be that artist, a movie that shows what making costs the maker. Sissy Spacek followed Loretta around for a year to get ready for that role, learned how to sound like her, walk like her, sang with her on stage at the Opry, two Loretta's up there side by side. If you made me do an impersonation of Loretta Lynn right now, I would do, Patsy's always saying, little girl, you got to live your own life, but my life's running me. Me doing Spacek, doing Loretta, doing Patsy. So many knots in the string. When Loretta had twins, she named one Peggy and one Patsy, one after her sister, one after Pine. When we moved to Georgia, the first friend my made was named Peggy, and I learned I should call her Miss Peggy since she was growing up, I knew through my parents. Miss Peggy had the slowest, steepest accent ever. Tanya, she would say when I saw her around town and my name sounded like it was falling down a hill. It sure is good to see you. You tell your mama I said hey. One afternoon at the food line, I said hello to Miss Peggy in line, only to have her turn around and give me a one-arm squeeze. Hey, sugar, I'm Patsy, not Peggy. Look the same, laugh the same, talk the same. Identical twins, just like in a soap opera. No two people were ever more alike. Not Peggy and Patsy Lynn, not Sissy Spacek and Miss Loretta, not me and my mother. Soap operas are the best because every day is a new chapter in the longest story most of us will ever know. Characters might die on a soap, but seldom do they stay dead. Old actors return with some cockamamie explanation for, explanation for their absence. A new actor steps in and everyone pretends the character always looked just like that. Miss Loretta died the other day. Peggy's and Patsy's are gone too. Beulah and Edna and Edith and Mildred all have moved along, which leaves me last of the knots into the string and never a stranger to meet. Thank you. Ah, thank you, Tanya Olson. Uh, thank you to all our readers. I want to remind you that you can see 30 fabulous LGBTQ plus poets on DC Pride Poem a Day. Please go to pridepoems.com. That's pridepoems.com. Thank you so much for joining us for the DC Pride Poetry Reading. Uh, be sure to check out the other sessions of 1455 Story Fest. Thank you.